LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi, everyone. Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, we're glad to have you on board. I hope your week went well. Mine is, uh, I'm recording now here on a Tuesday, so my week has obviously been pretty busy, and I haven't even gotten to Friday yet. So, but nevertheless, we're glad you're here. Do take a few moments, if you would, to give us a five-star review, ring the bell, and subscribe to the channel. And then if you have criticisms, comments, suggestions for shows, perhaps you want to be on the show you can reach out to me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com because otherwise if you don't tell me what you want me to talk about i'll talk about what i'm interested in and they may not co inside so and then of course yes even criticisms you can send me some of those some of you are gracious enough to send me send me some uh comments and uh certainly those are those that are constructive are certainly uh appreciated to be sure because that means you're listening because we want to make sure this is relevant to you do join us on facebook on the pesky podcast group glad to have you there talk about your triumphs and trials and of course ask questions to help you run your business well enough of the intro here i wanted to get to our guest his name is raleigh because calzadia hope i got that right calzadia he is the owner manager of pest wildlife pro that's pestwildlifepro.com and he's based in lower Man- miami florida and he is a specialist in bird control. I know that birds are certainly a major problem for many, many wildlife control operators because they're just so mobile and they get into places and there's heights and it's expensive. And well, you know far more about than the poo and all that kind of stuff. So welcome, Raleigh. We really appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you, Stephen. Glad to be here. Hi, everybody. Tell us a little about yourself. So I uh, I got into I, I fell into the pest control the bird control business through pest control. Uh, before uh, pest control, I was in construction. I have a general contractor license, and um, things uh, weren't going well with construction uh, during that time. The, you know the late OOS, I guess. You know, okay, know the late the turn, right, right, two thousand eight, the, 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 the recession, the Great Recession, right? right. right. Okay, so I'm just you know trying to re uh, rebrand myself and uh, fell into pest control. Fell in love with it. And um, when I started learning about birds, I'm like, uh, wow, this, everybody talks about how difficult it is. And it kind of came easy to me uh, because of my, my the skill set that I brought uh, from my previous life. And uh, so uh, working with a company that no longer exists, uh, started with a company called Stereotech. They were out of uh, Stereotech. Okay. And I uh, did three years with them. Uh, felt like I wanted to go more in the wildlife side of the business instead of the pest control. So I, uh, back in 08, I started a company called Bird and Bee Removal mm-hmm. and ran that for 15 years, I mean, for eight years until 2015. And uh, then I had an opportunity to go back to work for Stereotech uh, and be their wildlife guy here in Florida. And it was a, a great opportunity. I closed on the business and went to work for them. Uh, and they got bought by Renekill. Right. Then I uh, went to go work for Copacan. They got bought by Terminix. <laughs> So you have, so, you have seen a little bit of a merger activity in your yeah in your yeah the, the word on the street is if you want your company bought hire me <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious the, 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 well the you never know uh, do you want your year. business sold hire Raleigh and that'll yeah, make right. sure you so, get a good price too <laughs> so yeah the funny thing is so before before Renekill bought Terminex I started this business called Pest Wildlife Pro been uh, doing it for the last two and a half years okay and um. Yeah, having a lot of fun. Uh, definitely uh, doing a lot more than birds, which is my specialty. But uh, today I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about birds. So um, I I get asked a lot of questions of how to how to find a solution for birds, how to how to get to the, the there's so many options available. And, and if you mm. want to be good at bird work, you have to have a lot of tools in your tool belt. Right. So I'm open to every solution or option out there for bird control. And, um, but how do you, how do you narrow it down? So I asked customer uh, four key questions. The, the first one really doesn't have to do with the solution, but I think it's a very important question. It should always be the first question. Why are the birds being a pest? Yeah, uh, Cause that way the customer is gonna tell you what, what their pain point is, what's hurting yeah. them, what their hot buttons are. And, um, and then that'll uh, kind of help you drive the solution as well. So the, the, the next question, really the, the first question in finding the solution is who? Who is the bird species? Who's the bird? So what is the bird species? You have to learn how to identify birds. There's a lot of tools out there 
for identifying birds is actually a really cool one I recently found. I'm just going to look it up here on my phone real quick so I could yeah. talk to you about it. It's sure. called Picture Bird. Picture Bird. Is it, Picture it's Bird. an app for it's an app Android for phone. And, and iPhone? Yep. I think it costs okay. like 40 bucks for the year. But okay. you literally take a picture of a bird and it shoots you back the identification. Wow. If, if you don't see the bird, but you hear it, I tried it with a Blue Jay. I recorded the sound and it came back and it, and it, and it identified the bird for me from sound. No so, kidding. I thought that was wow. amazing. That is pretty so, good. Yeah. So you have to. A little scary know, as well when you think about it, but, but man, cool. there's some serious technology <laughs> out there. So, <laughs> so you have, right. Like, like an, an fucking dog. Um, okay. So, sorry. So, when you when you identify the bird, it's like anything else in pest control. So if you're you know if you're in the pest control side of the business, the first thing you want to do is identify the insect or the pest. So it's no right. different with birds. So identify the bird, um, because that's also going to determine. It's going to narrow down your solutions quite a bit depending on the species and depending on the protection status of the bird and right. the seasonality of the bird. So your your next uh, is what. So aside from asking the customer what is the bird that's making it a pest what do you see that the bird is doing that is making it a pest? So what is this, the bird's behavior? What is it doing? And then the last one is where? Where is this bird behaving badly? So it could be in a covered area, in an open area. It could be inside, outside. It could be under a pole barn. Uh, where? Where? Because the where is also going to narrow down the, the solutions. So Understanding that, then you know you go from fifty potential solutions down to three or four, right. and then you focus on those three or four, and maybe you use two or three of them in combination, affecting different senses of the bird uh, in different ways. You know, one could be a physical removal, or one could be exclusion. Uh, one could be um, a hazer that affects them in their in their senses when they smell it or when they when they taste it, and mm -hmm. another could be visual when they see the solution. So. Combine different solutions uh, based on the who, the what. So in your in, in your experience, uh, the jobs that you're doing, are you finding that you have to use, it's rare for you to use a single tool, are you usually using multiple tools? And by that, I mean, I would treat like netting as a separate tool from spikes sure. or uh, some sort of repellent device. So you would use, so you're saying we need to be sure that we're not getting so focused on a one trick pony. Yep. You got to really be beyond. So uh, what are the major, what are the big five tools that you think cover the vast majority of jobs? Or is that just a, a stupid question? No, no, there are no stupid questions. Obviously, um, you know, uh, you mentioned netting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think the, the 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 golden rule for netting is if it can be netted, it shall be netted. Okay, I like it's, that. It's the, best, it's the best solution out there uh, when installed properly, mm -hmm. and when and when sold to the customer properly. There's a lot yeah. of bad uh, vibes bad. about netting out there because uh, people, the, the, some end user customers think, oh, it looks ugly because they've seen yeah. a lot of ugly nets installed out there, especially yeah. over signage. Yeah. And if you do it right, if you do it square, you do it tight, it actually looks very good. Um, yeah, I agree. So, yeah. so netting, uh, now you can't always net. So, right. you know, you, you have other, other options. I think optical gel is a great uh, solution. You really like, you really like optical gel? I like it. I, you okay. know, if, if, if I got to install a thousand optical gel pucks versus 5,000 square feet of netting, I'll probably go with the 5,000 square feet of netting. Yeah. Now, here's what happens. You have, you net off. For practical reasons, you can only do the net so low and in certain and in, in, in so many areas. Right. So you're covering their primary nesting, perching, roosting sites. But when you move these birds, particularly pigeons, they're very persistent to stay where they are. So you might have to put, they're going to find secondary perches, at least temporarily. So you might have to put a couple of optical gel pucks on some wall lights or some different areas below the net where they weren't there before, but they're going to be there now. So as a good, as a professional, you anticipate these situations and you include them in your in your proposal. Yeah, kind so of like when you're, a, B, C. yeah. So when you're evaluating a site, so you were talking about the where, and I love your five, you love your four questions. So when they're when you're evaluating that where, you as the professional need to think the next step. Okay, if I remove the birds from here unless you kill them, of course, but I mean, if, you, if you're if you pushing them somewhere else, 
you got to think about is the next place going to be a problem for my client and so you need to think about where would they might go that would might anger my client so that right. would be and, the and, and there's even two ways to look at it right the, the next place that they would go within the area that you're covering mm -hmm. and the next place that they would go within the structure the facility the, right okay the, the entire place so yeah just think think a few steps ahead because then you know you're you're giving you're creating yourself opportunities for future future growth in your business so you like netting you like optical gel it's good to hear that because you know you just see stuff that's advertised and you're like mm, you know it just you know, seems the, just too good to be true right <laughs> well you know but the thing is with that with optical gel if you don't clean and sanitize the way that they teach you how to do it yeah then don't say it didn't work right Follow the directions, everybody. Yeah. Follow well, the directions. And and, <laughs> and if you and if you get cheap and you space them too far apart, because yeah. it's an optical it's an optical illusion. Birds are smart, so if you space them too far apart and you give that bird a place to stand between them, then it's going to look down and go. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they, they, they figure it out. So follow the directions. I think with anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, another another good solution um another another solution that i like and i see it, it's, it's got potential is the the lasers from bird control group so the avix autonomous and they're handheld uh but they're very they're species specific you know if you got really pigeons, I, I think so i mean if you got pigeons okay. if you got pigeons nesting somewhere and you you know you point the laser at them while they're nesting they're not going to move but if they're if they're just loafing or roosting so it's it, it depends again the bird what it's doing and where so you might have an airplane hangar that has pigeons in it. Mm -hmm. So netting the entire hangar for the customer is cost prohibitive, you know, let's say a quarter million dollars. Right. But if you right. come in and you net the primary, you do strategic netting, you do netting over the entrance and on the pockets where the doors nest. Yeah. And then you put lasers inside uh, on each side, uh, scaring the birds out, then you could probably solve the problem with $75,000, $80,000 versus one hundred and fifty, for example. And how long do the, do you have an idea how long those particular lasers, because those are sort of mounted and they go through a random pattern or they had motion censored? No, you program them. Program them, okay. So you create a program uh, to do a certain movement. Mm -hmm. And then you create another program to cover another area or that you overlap them. But then the, the, the system itself, so the, the, the program inside the laser, randomizes all those little modules that you create. Oh, okay. So you, the more little modules that you create of 20, 30, 40 points of yeah. movement, then the system randomizes them. So if you have 10 of them, it's not going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, it'll go you know, okay. 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, right. it'll just randomize them. So the, bird, the birds are less likely to get used to it. No, With birds, no you never say never, and you never say always. Well, the yeah, right, but, birds, it, but it gets to a point, and especially if you're excluding them from the the high pressure areas that are really that are really difficult, where maybe they could hide from the laser. Then that's now they're fully exposed. Right, so that's why you 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 do strategic netting in the areas of the highest mm. pressure. Okay, and so what's your fourth item? So I'm pretty excited about uh, a product that I'm that I'm repping for Roth Chemicals. So Roth Chemicals is the manufacturer of methyl and okay. So they're the ones that make the Eco 4.0 and the Eco 14.5, which are used in the hazers where they're used for hazing uh, or for um, either thermal or ULV foggy. All right. Um, and they just came out with a new product. Uh, I'm gonna try to show it here with. All right. Look at it. Oh. Eco Bird 14.5. Bird repellent. Bird repellent. So, so it's a bird repellent in a can that shoots like a kind of wasp spray, about 20 feet. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. 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 So it's so pretty cool. So the, the website for it is birdhazercan.com. All right. Let's get that birdhazer.com. Birdhazercan. Can. Oh, I got you. Sorry. Birdhazercan.com. Okay. And um, it's a good it's a good option for spot treatment. So you might have a small situation. Um, it's something that every uh, every technician can carry in their in their vehicle. Uh, you could also so you're familiar with that gotcha sprayer pole attachment that you put it on a, on an extension pole uh, okay. to shoot wasp spray. Sure, so this, is, this is compatible with that. Oh, so now you get an extra 20 30 feet of, of height plus the 20 feet that it shoots. 
So if you needed to move birds out of a particular area, maybe before you're going to do some netting, you know, like they're just hanging out and they're being a pain and you got to get them or they're, going. Or you're almost done with the netting. You haven't completely closed it off and you need to flush them out. It's kind flush of like a flushing out. agent too. Yeah. Or if you're trying to trap sparrows inside a grocery store, for example, and um, they're hiding from you and you, and you have the mist nets so, and they're hiding somewhere, you want to flush them out. So this is uh, food grade. So the label is nice. pretty liberal. could be used indoors, outdoors. So read the label, obviously, the label yeah. is law, but it's, it's, it's pretty liberal and um, there's a potential lot of good uses for it. So I'm pretty excited about this product. Yeah, so let's get that mentioned again. So birdhazer can, C-A-N yep. dot com. So birdhazer, that's H-A-Z-E-R can.com uh is a, is a nice product remember you're probably gonna need to get a pesticide license for those of you who don't have it get it you need to get your pesticide license and make sure you're insured and follow your state rules and then this is another tool in the toolbox you need to want to check out excellent yeah and it's also available at animal traps and supplies at ats okay ats yeah ats is carrying it all right animal trap supply that's ats okay excellent well that can be quite useful so are there any other places where you have that uh, that flushing agent i mean certainly yeah because there's places where a laser won't work right because if the bird's hiding in a around a corner the laser is not going to work so you could flush oh. that bird out and then and a laser might you might not have a laser because of the cost of the laser is, is, is yeah is pretty substantial right. so okay. so it's, it's something that you could carry in your truck and it's a good um low cost I, what i call i call it a low cost trial and error solution Right. It allows for a little trial and error because so the can retails for fifty dollars a can, mm -hmm. and by the time you buy a case, the the cost could go down into the twenty five to thirty dollar range. Sure. So so they're they're reasonably it, it's if you use it and you solve a problem for a customer and you're charging two hundred and fifty dollars, right. then it you know more than pay for itself. It, it, Absolutely. It's tough, yeah. It, but you have to allow you have to manage the customers' expectations and allow for a little trial and error. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. it's not a not an absolute like netting. Yeah. If you net it right. The birds aren't coming back. Right, right. Unless, of course, some electrician comes and cuts your net. That's good. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. So, and what do you have for number five? So number five, yeah, I've been thinking about it. Okay. And um, you know, I like um, I like the eagle eye. The eagle eye. Oh no, kidding. Okay. I like the so de again, depending on the bird species, uh, yeah. it works pretty good with grackles. Ah. And. Um, but again, if you, if you, you know, people always tell me, oh, well, yeah, it doesn't work because there's a pigeon standing right next to it. It's not intended to, to work when, when, when the bird is standing next to it. It's intended to scare the bird when it's flying. So it sees oh. a reflection, uh, kind of like the same as the woodpecker intimidators. Uh, okay. It's a, it's a spinner, it reflects yeah. light. So, so the bird, these birds that we uh, consider pests are prey birds, right? It's the opposite of a bird of prey. These birds are preyed upon by birds of prey. Mm -hmm. So these visual flashes scare the bird into thinking that there's a predator. So they don't, they're not comfortable. They, it, 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 they, they can't um, feed, they can't keep their head down to eat, or they can't focus on drill, the woodpecker focus on drilling the hole. Yeah. So if these things are flashing around it and it's scaring the bird. Eventually it's like, oh, you know what? Birds are very mobile, right? You've never seen, you've never seen a bird holding a sign that says I'm hungry feeding. <laughs> Although people feed them all the time. Birds have some, even the smallest bird, a sparrow, can fly five miles in half a day. Yeah. So they they don't need our help to find food. So if we're if, if they don't feel comfortable somewhere, and that's why I think that's how the visual devices work. It scares them, and they like you know what? Now if if you're trying to use an eagle eye for bird, for pigeons nesting, guess what? They right. Work. Right. Now that's the is that the triangular pyramid version? Yep. Now I've seen companies use the cup spinners uh, i think i've seen the home depot shop but it looked like yep. i've seen businesses installing these things before they have a problem which i'm like finally someone is using someone's finally using a frightening device before the birds have habituated to the spot and i'm thinking yes. that that's the time to really use it i was shocked that actually companies were moving in that direction i was yep. stunned yeah, and i would never and i would never do a frightening device depending on the bird species unless I'm also doing population control. So if okay. I'm, you know, the, the, the pigeons, I mean, you know, probably the number one pest bird. Mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're not doing population control along with, uh, with exclusion or frightening device, especially with frightening devices, 
you're not going to get the results. Yeah, you know, it's not. There's no silver bullets. It's not a magic little wand you wave. You install the eagle eye, and the birds say, "Oh crap, this place is scary. Let's get out of here." No, this is their home. This is where this is where they were born, right? So a pigeon that is born in a site wants to die in a site, and sometimes it's our job just to accelerate that life cycle. For mm. Your thoughts on the uh, birth control for 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 birds? Oval control. Is it oval control. Do you think that it's is it? Uh, too too slow for many most clients to to work and so is it something more of a maintenance down the road where do you see that fitting yeah, it's, it's kind of like model? it's kind of like uh i'm cool i'm trying to save the birds uh, situation you have a customer that might be the thing is if you're if you got a city block and you have one building that you're that is your customer and they have a pigeon problem but the pigeon problem is in the whole city block or five city blocks hmm. then using the oval control, you're going to solve the problem for, or in two years, you're going to solve the problem for a very large area. Right. And, and it's, it's too expensive for that one building to do it. But if you're talking to municipalities or you're talking to, you know, let's say a university campus, mm -hmm. especially where the kids don't want, you know, the, you know, the kids right, today right. are more sensitive to things like that. <laughs> <That's right>. So, <laughs> you know, you set up these oval control feeding stations throughout a mm -hmm. university campus and you manage the customer's expectations that, hey, the population will go down over time. Now it's not cheap either, right? So, but it, you know, you put it on an automatic feeder, you put it on a monthly program, and I think there's a, there's a place for it, but it's only for pigeons. Yeah, right. Um, if, I think if I I'm have... wondering if they're ever going to get a label beyond beyond pigeons, but I do think that if people would, I mean, when I've talked to people about it, I'd like you know, hey, trap them, trap the pigeon population down. That saves you a lot of cost straight away, yeah. and then then you have your feeding fewer, which reduces your, your daily cost, and then just use your feeding to get to drop the population even further, like right. you trap the dumb pigeons. You can accelerate it. Right. Yeah, and it really accelerate it. And then you kind of split the baby there a little bit, especially mm -hmm. if you can't do the kind of exclusion that, you know, is the platinum standard, of course. Yeah, some people, yeah, some people don't. It, it, sometimes it's not practical, and sometimes it's just cost prohibitive. Right, right. Because another question that I that, that I wind up trying to find out from the customer, and this was a little harder to find out, because um, especially if they're being a little cryptic, is how how much do you think the problem is worth? You know, do you have a do you have a fifty thousand dollar problem or do you have a five thousand dollar problem? If I come up with a fifty thousand dollar solution, but the customer in their head has a five thousand dollar problem, guess what? Yeah. It's my job to sell them up, or yeah. it's my job to meet their expectations as best I can with the options I have, yeah. and maybe I could solve the problem in their biggest pain point area for the amount of money that they have to spend. And then I tell them, because every commercial customer that I ever deal with lives and dies by their budget because that's how their bonuses are set and all that. So when you're dealing right. with commercial customers, if it's not in their budget, they're not gonna spend the money now. Right. They're, they, they're blowing their cleaning budget by, you know, by keep cleaning the bird poop. Yep. And maybe they could move some of that money to the pest control budget or whatever yep. budget would be bird yep. control. So it's kind of having those conversations at a business level as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe put it on the budget for next year. Hey, you're going to save, you know, you're spending all this money cleaning this bird poop every week. or and, and then what people don't understand too is what's the opportunity cost of that? Okay, your maintenance right. person wastes all this time cleaning, but they're neglecting changing the filters on the HVAC equipment. Right. And now further down the road, you have a $20,000 expense to replace or repair your HVAC equipment. And have you ever encountered like the disease issue? Like if someone's having to constantly be cleaning bird droppings or if they wait so long that they now have a major accumulation, what's the potential risk if, you know, especially if let's say they have cancer or they're on one of these uh, immune suppressing drugs or they have diabetes, which means their immune system's not quite as good. That's the thing that kind of scares me a little bit. It's yeah. like, you know, if you're healthy and you're know, young and vibrant and you're not in the winds blowing the right way, yeah, probably nothing's going to happen. Or if it's all, if it's baked in the sun and the sun's killing everything, but I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm not, where do, have you seen that fit into the equation somewhere? Like what about the health cost of yeah. some of this stuff? Well, it, it, I think it's, it's more, and it's more uh, poignant in a place that is, has food, right? Mm -hmm. So either food processing, food yeah, handling, yeah, right. food distribution, uh, but also healthcare. So, yeah. you know, I had a, a hospital that had pictures in their parking garage where the employees parked. And when I told the director of environmental services, when I, when I told him, go, 
What about the what about all that bird waste that's being tracked into tracked your building? Tracked into the building. Yep. Right. Yeah. That, that's what sold it. That's what sold yep. the job. Yeah. But but it's not fear mongering, it's education. That's correct. Yeah. But that's there's evidence. There's uh some really good research out of Chicago that showed that teachers were getting allergies from bird exposure to bird feces, even though the birds were on the other side of the window. Yeah. Uh, well, I was like, that's amazing. Um that when you get the mites just, coming in too. Yeah, it's just amazing that can happen. So uh without a doubt. So you do some consulting, I believe. You do some yes. you help people. So let's talk a little about that for some some of our listeners who may be looking for maybe they've got a big job or what kind of training or consultation do you do for people? Why don't you describe that for them so sure, they have sure. a, a sense? Yeah. So um I you know when it comes to training, there's there's a lot out there. Um, you know, go to your to where you buy the product from, I think, and start there. Mm -hmm. um, what I also say is don't, uh, you know, unless they're giving you enough leads to sustain your business, um, explore explore options from other vendors. Explore because no one vendor has all the products for bird control, mm -hmm. and you want to have the, the biggest tool belt possible. So I start there. Uh, but get trained by, you know, get training and have relationships from all the manufacturers, but they're going to train you on their products. Right. Uh, NACOA, National Wildlife Control Operating Association, has a good bird training. Uh, so I direct, I direct people to them as well. Um, if they have a, if they have a big, like you described earlier, if they have a big bird job that they need help with, I could come in in one of two capacities. Um, help them uh, price it, sell it, do it or come in, uh, help them price it and sell it and come in with my own crew and do the job as a subcontractor. Okay, so you offer, so you offer the total package. You can help them, gu guide them in the process for, for, for converting the job to a, to a business, to a sale. And they're paying me for they, my time. Yeah, so if you're a single person operator and you get the big hospital contract and you're like, I don't have enough employees to do this, you have someone to call right here and they will come in and do it and then put their they put a markup on it they make money yeah. and everybody's happy everybody's or happy. Um, you know i come in by myself or just with one person or two people and then they have a couple of their own people and we do a hybrid yeah. where I, I work with their people and then there's a there's a training aspect to it a hands-on training aspect to it yeah but um if the person like you know like they say in deadliest catch if the person's a greenhorn and they've never hung a bird net and you want me to train you how to how to do uh, uh, an airplane hanger you know, it's like crawl, walk, run. You, you're ready. You're, you're trying to run, but you haven't even crawled. Right, so, right. but if you have somebody that's been doing the five, ten thousand dollar jobs here and there, and, and and knows how to start and finish the bird net job, yeah. But they want to take it to the next level. I think that's where then I come in because your biggest savings, um, the biggest hit to your bottom line on bird work is labor. Yeah, driven by labor, yeah. um, because labor also affects uh, the lift and travel so if you're traveling and you take an extra week than you didn't expect then that is you're going to pay the lift an extra week or lifts right. plural and travel expenses for an extra week yeah but if you turn a two-week job into one week because you learn how to work efficiently then all that profit also goes into your bottom line so it's yeah. expense profit but it's all labor driven so i think it's yeah so just to sort of put a bow on this and just everyone if you're a small operator or even a rel you know maybe a a bigger small business where maybe you have a few employees it, stop saying no and yeah. for bird jobs right so if you have some bird jobs that are out there stop saying no find people like raleigh that can help you uh do those do those jobs and you may be able to just simply do the referral and maybe be the face and get your markup and move on and maybe or hang along and get some real world training. But we need to stop saying no uh, and make make those sales. Because sometimes clients need to get these jobs done and they need a place to do it. And they, if they're comfortable with you, there's there's resources and they can fly in and hit hit the ground running with all the expertise and make sure there's not a mistake because the mistakes can be quite expensive. Quite 
Well, and you also <laughs> run the risk. You also run the risk of getting a competitor into your account. So yeah, yeah, I don't do bird work, uh, but then your competitor not only does bird work, but does everything that you do. Right. So that competitor goes into the customer, does the bird work, says, "Hey, you're happy with your pest control company? Or you're, yeah. you're the guy that does <laughs> your trapping and all that? Sure, we are. Okay, hey, no problem. We snatch that. We do yeah. this, but but it's a wedge. Now they yeah. got a relationship with your customer. Yeah. Where if you find somebody like me, for example, and it doesn't have to be me, it could be some, you know, there's people throughout the, the country and yeah, um, that, that do this, but that don't do the stuff that you do. And they're not gonna, they're not going to go after your customer. Yeah. So that could even be, even if you don't do it, you also have, Raleigh is very connected. I've known Raleigh for, for years. Uh, he's, he is very connected with a variety of people. So even if he's not the one on the ground, he probably knows someone who could be on the ground and get that type of coordination done. Just be sure to send them some, uh, make sure you pay him and don't always look for everything free folks. He's got to make a living too. So just throwing that out there. So the kids need shoes. You got the kids in these shoes. <laughs> so where do you see, uh, with, the, with the light of your experience, because you've been through a lot, right? You've been a contractor, you've been a construction worker, you've had your own business, now you're back into your own business again, you've been into the corporate world of pest, pest control. Where do you see the, there seems to be a lot of development occurring in the bird space. Positive? Are you seeing like we're really getting some real solutions for those difficult jobs that where a net just is not cost effective? Yeah. Are we really getting some solutions that you think uh, are? are we I think really so. I'm, I'm excited direction? about. Yeah, I'm excited about the fact that there's a lot of training. There's a lot yeah. of exposure to, to doing it right, and mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, you know, there's one of the, you know, we talked about the five products earlier and, you know, if there was a six or maybe somewhere in that five, you gotta, you gotta look at this new, new technology that Flockoff has, that yeah. electromagnetic technology. Um, you know, it's not, it's not going to come in and replace netting. Mm -hmm. And it's very speed. That is, that is very species specific. Uh, the, it doesn't work as well with the small birds or it's, 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 it's even though it emits uh, an electromagnetic field, it's also very directional. So you have to know how to point the, the components to make sure you're affecting the birds. Um, it is um, kryptonite for seagulls. Really? I think, it's a great, I think it's a great solution for seagulls. So no kidding. Okay. It was designed for, for pigeons, so it's always a good solution for pigeons. Uh, I've installed it for pigeons, for turkey vultures, and for grackles. And both the turkey vultures and the grackles took a little tweaking, but, but it worked. But it worked. So, no kidding. Black um, vultures? Uh, turkey vultures. To, just turkey, I, but not. I don't have those here. You I, don't have I, black I, vultures in Florida? Not, not, not here in South Florida. I don't see them. Oh, okay. All right. You know, yeah, I, I'll have to look. I'll, I'll have to look see at them. That. I'll see them in 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 rural areas. Yeah, but in the high rise buildings and along the the Atlantic Ocean, I get calls for turkey vultures all the time. The, high, the, the taller the building and the top floors. Mm -hmm. Those birds love to hang around those those uh, condominiums. Interesting, interesting. And so, where do you see the industry going at this point? So, we're getting a lot more training and experience. I guess you're saying that you know bird control work seems to be getting done. I would assume better. Yes. Where the quality has gone up. And so, what's the next big need now in the industry as you see it? Where what if you could wave a magic wand and we're going to invent a tool? What would that tool? What would that tool be? Oh, for me as an applicator, the anti-gravity boots. <laughs> that would certainly save a lot of falls, I'm sure. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> but, but all kidding aside, yeah, um, no, you know, I'm serious. See, it, I don't I don't see a magic bullet in the future or a silver bullet. I see better trained professionals using all the tools effectively or more okay. effectively in you know, using the tools in the right combinations. You have but understanding the why, the who, the what, and the, and, the, and the where. Do you think we'll ever get rid of perch back? You remember we're rid of perch, rid of bird, or uh, okay. the to it's called toxic perch? It used to be a, it'd be a metal tube oh, right. with a uh, a wick inside. So when the birds landed on it, they would absorb the pesticide yes. through their feet. I've heard about that. That was before my time. And then keel over. You know, uh, if you, I, not in our world, not in yeah. this country. Um, 
you know, we, we never talked, we haven't talked about Avatrol. I think there's a place for Avatrol. Okay. If we, Avatrol has, uh, you know, Sheldon at Avatrol has really taken the, the baton. He has. And, and done this yeah. training and the stewardship program and gone with yeah. the Avatrol Easy Blend, teaching yeah. people that you don't throw it, you never throw it straight. It was never on the label. Right. But the label allows for a much higher dosage than he is even recommending in training. And, you know, the training people use it at 40 to 1. That's to, amazing. Yeah, I've heard, to, personal effect. I've heard 50 to 1. I've heard that he's even had clients who've had no mortality. Yeah, I've, I've done heard. it. No mortality. Oh, you've done it. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fair, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll use the Avatrol Easy Blend for either sparrows, um, mm -hmm. pigeons, starlings. Um, and you know, even though a pigeon will eat a whole corn and a, and a sparrow won't, yeah, a pigeon will eat the green. So if you just use the green, and I've used it at forty to one, and and I've had a, a combination of both pigeons and house sparrows in a in a you know in a in a job, nice. where after I do the first application, you know, after I do all the pre baiting, the first time I go hot, those sparrows are disappeared, and then the pigeons take a second, third, and maybe a fourth uh, application. Yeah. So you just simply apply a little bit more often rather than trying to hit them with that, you know, 5% population kill where yeah, they right were yeah. doing before, where they're getting that 20% kill sometimes and what? birds flying, dropping out of the sky, yeah, people are screaming. Exactly. I tell people all the time when I'm, when I'm <laughs> trying to sell them on an app. And, and the, what I wanted to circle back to your point is yep. it's hard to sell people on Avatrol right. at the 40 to 1, doing it the right way, the way that, the way that I'm doing it. Imagine trying to sell people on what you described earlier. That that, yeah. that stuff. It's like going back to using Durzban. Yeah. For, people, for bugs. Yeah, we're not. He has. Our society's not there anymore. Yeah, Avatrol has really come a long way. And I think that there's, a, and I just wonder, and I don't make any money on this, folks, just throwing it out there. I don't make uh, any, any money on this. I just, I want to see tools stay in the industry. And so I was really pleased that, uh, you know, with Avatrol and other pests, because it really did get some bad reputation from some incidents that occurred that made the news and birds are dropping out of the sky and uh, people were using it like, a, like an avicide rather than a repellent, which is right. a frightening device, which is what it was actually designed for. Uh, it's a flock it was, dispersal. Yeah, flock dispersal and that people were just, <sighs> I mean, he's, he's come a long way to trying to change that Yes, and no. but the thing is you have you have to peel the onion so yeah. we get it people like you and me get it operators are being uh, there's been a lot of training to get operators to get it yeah but then you got to peel the onion a little more how do you get the customer at right. the local at your level to get it and then right. even more difficult to convince is the decision maker the boss of the boss of the boss of the boss right. of the person that you're talking to yeah. who wants to protect their brand at all costs they're very risk averse and so how do you train, how do you get them to understand that if Avatrol is used effectively, it's no kill yeah. and it's effective and it's also very cost effective? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that is this is something that I've spoken frequently about and that is wanting trade organizations to begin the lobbying process. Unfortunately, I have not been able to convince trade organizations to the yeah, training is important. I'm in, I'm a fan of training, but there's more to a trade organization than simply creating qualified workers. We need someone that's going to have the time to lobby government, to create white papers, to respond yes. to news reports. And there doesn't seem to be any interest in that whatsoever. And I've been arguing for that for years and I can't seem to get any traction. Then people are like, why are we have all these, all these problems? Because some of these problems are political and educational in nature and no company is gonna spend the time and the money to do that because everyone says, well, it's just self-serving. I mean, look at what uh, what the pest control world does. They have organizations where they're putting out press release. Now they're granted a lot bigger. They can do TV ads. But there's a lot of small things that the state associations can do to yeah. try to push back. There's no one will do it. Yeah. And I think and, it's a yeah, here, here in Florida, uh, uh, FPMA does um, does work pretty well. Uh, you know, yeah. we had um, we had uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, re, um, put out uh, meetings about redoing the trapping laws and all that. And um, they were pretty active. You know, they, were, they were pretty active. So yeah, that's, it, that's it, what's it, necessary, it but it takes yeah. it so slow, isn't it? It's a lot of work and it it's takes yeah, painful it's and slow. And that's in, I get it. And, but the point is, is that it's, 
you're, you have to till the field in order to th- and protect the future of the industry. I mean, we're, yeah. and that's what, and we're not seeing the bigger, the longer term picture. We need to be thinking more strategically rather yeah. than simply tactically. And so. Well, and what happens too is for every person like me, an operator that was at this meeting, for example, for the Florida Fish and Wildlife for Trapping, for every one of us, mm-hmm. there was five um, people that were completely against trapping birds for yep. because yep. you know or not birds i'm sorry animals in general right because sure. you know because you're a you murderer know, you're, you're right and so <laughs> you know all extremes are bad extremes yeah and that's and, that's and sometimes it, they're the ones that are driving the agenda they absolutely are um and it's in that that sort of thing but that's you know a little off track here but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it's in one of my favorite hobby horses so let's try to uh Anything that we that we didn't talk about that you think is important for our our listeners who are getting into bird control, you've given them those four important questions. I think that's absolutely critical. Now, if you didn't hear it, you need to go back and listen to it again because that is gold right there, folks. That's going to save you a lot of pain. But is there something else? What would be some advice that you'd say if you're getting into bird work, do this or avoid this? What would be a tip you'd give them before you finish? We finish up here. Well, before, before you get into it, make sure, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. You know, you trial and error with bird work in general is very expensive. So you don't want to, and, and you don't want to ruin your reputation as an operator in the other verticals that you do uh, to then screw up bird work. Yeah. So there's a lot of resources out there. Ask for help. I can be one of those resources for you, uh, but I'm not the only resource. So right. You know, go on Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of uh, groups. Uh, you know, wildlife control business business builders. Uh, Nicola has uh, several groups. Uh, chats, ask questions in there. There's a lot. Of, you know, you're going to get some kooky people giving you some stupid answers sometimes, but eventually you'll you'll find somebody that'll give you the right answer, and you, you can network. Uh, you know, join these organizations, network, get trained. Mm. Um, don't don't wing it. It's it's too. It's too expensive to wing it. Birds are too smart. Yeah, know, know your birds. Um, one of the things that I want to tease uh, before we wrap this up is um, sure. there's there's a lot of books in the industry for the bugs, for the pest control, you know, the malice handbook. And, you know, within that, the mouse handbook, there's one chapter for vertebrates. And then within there's yeah. a few pages for birds. Yeah. It's like, right? yeah. And, then, yeah, and there's a lot of other books out there for birds, for bird watching. For bird lovers, they have beautiful pictures That's of right. all the birds, easy to identify them. Right. But there's really no one pest control bird book that I've ever been able to see that really has that level of that substance. So I'm in the process, uh, with a little help from some other uh, people, of writing a book that I'm probably going to call the Pest Bird Handbook. The Pest Bird pages. Handbook. Okay. 150 to 200 pages. Doesn't have to be full of colorful photos because there's plenty of those in the books that people can buy for bird loving. Yeah. But a lot of, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to write a book and put it out there to help answer that question, that previous question that you had, you know, I'm getting, I want to do bird work. I'm getting started. How do I hire the right people? Because you may, you know, your route technician, if you're a pest control company and you want to get into bird work, your route technician that says, this is my, this is what I do at 8 a.m. on the third Thursday of every week. And, you know, they're very, very uh, structured. Your personality for a person that does bird work is, I don't want to live the same day twice. Right. And um, and they have to be, you can never be afraid of heights. No. And and you have to be good with tools and you have to have a very high safety IQ. So it's, it's a, it's a very different work. So now, so you just have to go down to that level. You know, do I have the people in my organization that have these skill sets? And do, if not, do I want to, can I afford to hire them or do I sub it out or do I, sub it out for a while, build my team, and then grow into it. You know, there's a lot of options out there, but know it. So you're looking to make this a business, a business owner's guide to both the business portion of the, of the business, as well as the technical portion of the business. Okay. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that mixes both of those elements out there that I'm aware of. Yeah. Fascinating. And and it could also be, yeah, it could also be, you know, somebody who's a chief engineer at at a, at a major at a big facility and they they're, they're, they have questions about birds and there's like hey you know this this let me read this book at least yeah. you know we want we want to educate the end user as well but, but it's more definitely an operator book yeah it's very technical yes yeah, because uh, an educated end user is a better customer 
right? That was and it's not a substitute that. to training either. The book right. is not a substitute to training. Right. Now, a book like that in combination with training, then that's without a doubt. You know, like a college level course for bird control. Excellent. Well, I will look forward to it. I certainly want to do a review of it. So let me know when that's uh, as you're getting yeah. as you're progressing on. I'll definitely want to read. Yeah, it's going from uh, here to here. Yes, I, I understand. It's um, but there's people who do ghost writing, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to skin that, uh, to skin that, that the way it can that skin that cat. So, well, everyone, we hope you've enjoyed this. Did you have something more to say? Oh, man, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, and um, I'm, I'm glad we were able to do it. I know you've been yeah. after me for, for a while. A little, little while, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad we were able to connect up. So yeah. uh, you've been listening to Raleigh Calzadilla. He is the owner-manager of Pest Wildlife Pro. That's Pest Wildlife Pro. And you can visit him at his website at pestwildlifepro.com, where he can provide you some consultation, if you wish, some training, if you wish. And then also, he can bring his his team to do the job for you or with you whatever the situation so stop saying no about different bird jobs so he can be definitely a resource for you that you want to check that out so definitely that's raleigh calzadilla again owner operator and manager of pest wildlife pro pest wildlife pro.com raleigh thank you so much for being with us today really appreciate it so well everyone that's the end of this particular show you've been listening to living the wildlife don't forget to take a few moments do some subscribe to the channel. If you have questions, concerns, you can reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And you've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to be the wildlife. Excuse me, live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. <laughs> yeah, I'll right, get that right. out eventually. All yeah. right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>